Udo Proch, King of All Spies. Udo Proch, King of All Spies, a film by Stash. Udo Proch was born May 29th, 1934, and he died June 27th, 2001. To the world, he was an Austrian businessman, an industrialist, the owner of the Royal Viennese Confectionery House, Café Damel. To the world, he was just a mere criminal, but not a small case. He ensured some junk and some coal mining equipment, I believe a broken down coal mine conveyor belt to be closer to it and more specific for 20 million USD. And he put a time bomb on the freighter ship Lacona and it blew up, killing six people in the Indian Ocean in 1977. It is said by some he was protected by powerful Austrian politicians and friends. He is sometimes referred to as a socialist millionaire playboy. Above his Dammel house was one of the lodges of the secretive Freemasonic or quasi-Freemasonic at the very least, Club 45, were very powerful ministries of Austria were involved in. He was a colorful character to say the least. My apologies to the families of those who died in the Lacona sabotage event. I just can't help my interest in Udo Proch. I call him the king of all spies straight off. And again, the world will try to deny this. And that's what I'll be talking about a bit in this mini documentary. Proch was a celebrity in Austria, and he was the first husband of actress Daphne Wagner, daughter of Wieland Wagner and the great granddaughter of composer Richard Wagner. And not only that, the great granddaughter of Franz Liszt, high Viennese society. There has already been done uh, a lot of media on him, not in the U.S. specifically, but of course in Europe and especially Austria. So there's been a film called The Lacona Affair about that um, sinking of the ship, the Lacona. And the art group Monochrome did an actual musical called Udo 77, a musical about the life of Proch. And my favorite, a documentary about Proch called Udo Proch Out of Control. I'm not saying mine's going to be as good as that, but I'm going to kind of more focus on his espionage or espionage activity. So this is going to be leading up to a novel I'm working on called The Last American Spy. If Udo was involved in espionage in the 80s, 70s, and 90s, early 90s, well, well then, I'm going to sort of point you in that direction whenever I can. So sit back now and enjoy Udo Proch, King of All Spies.
Chapter 1, Udo Proch, King of All Spies Background So, after World War II, the Allies had won. And now, the then-Soviet Union and the Americans, both having huge armies, started to turn on one another. There was the Berlin Airlift. And the Russians grabbed as many Nazi rocket scientists and technicians as they could, and the Americans did the same. It was a mysterious Operation Paperclip. Don't kid yourself, the Americans grabbed every Nazi they could. Among them, Werner von Braun. And again, so did the Soviets. And then the Berlin Airlift, and then the Wall. Keep in mind, both the Americans and the Russians had huge armies at the time. Or should I say, and I must emphasize this greatly, the Soviets. And they had an excellent military, and a huge military. But they did fall behind in certain sophisticated technologies, and in particular, the chips, the chip software. So a huge black market developed in the Cold War race. One of the earliest groups of smugglers was headed by a man named Werner J. Bruckhausen. So Bruckhausen had an elaborate network of spies and smugglers, and he bought technology or stole it from the Americans and the West. Incredibly, in the late 1980s, Bruckhausen attempted a helicopter escape from a Tallahassee federal prison, but an undercover busted him. Can you believe that? Right out of James Bond, a helicopter escape. Another man's name was Richard Mueller, or Monaton Mueller. Or Me Richard Megabox Mueller. He was very shadowy and mysterious. He had a huge mansion. He gave out $400 tips. He had guard dogs, jets, and became probably the most successful technology smuggler, aka techno bandit, or many other names for that. So embargoed high technology was pretty much a lot like being a drug dealer. Well, there's a huge market for black market goods, and this became similar. It wasn't without danger. Some guys lost their lives. There was a lot of money involved. And so it moved on, and at some point it began to be discovered that Austria was the main conduit for goods going into the Soviet Union. The Austrians weren't very interested in whether or not it was moral or not, I guess you might say. Um, at least some of the businessmen, they were uh, an affluent society and some of the guys were looking to make big cash on smuggling so the Germans lost greatly in the espionage war in World War II. The so-called Red Orchestra ran circles around them. Admiral Carnaris himself of German intelligence turned out to be a spy and a traitor. But in the Cold War itself, the Stasi was legendary for its networks. They had files on everyone. And they had an Austrian residence. That is the Ministry of State Security residency. <clears throat> Among the great players were the subject of this mini documentary, Udo Proch, who sometimes went by the name of Serge Kierhofer, Rudolf Wein, Rudolf Sacker. Heinz Fneudel, who we'll talk about a little bit more. 
Dr. Carl Zena. And not only did these guys procure goods from the West, of course, and particularly from the Americans, and sell it to the KGB, the KGB, which was Directorate T. So Directorate T was similar to the Scientific Directorate of the CIA. And they had a Line X that was the super elite group that were attempting to procure high-tech goods from the Americans. And who among us didn't watch Orson Welles in the, the spy thriller, The Third Man? So Vienna was the city of spies, just like Berlin. There were checkpoints everywhere. And all of these smugglers also got into the business of owning cafes. So there was Rudolf Wein purchased the club Grundhof. And Dr. Carl Zena owned the striptease bar Casanova. And, of course, Udo outdid them all buying the Damel House, the Royal Confectionery. And in 1972, upstairs or thereabouts, they, cl they formed Club 45. Behind them all was a shattery business guy named Max Peterhans. And in the early 70s, 1971, 1976, he owned quite a few companies backed by Swiss banks that were buying this stuff. So he was with them. Rudolf Sacker was with the Vienna Stasi group, as well as our man Udo Proch. So this was the main conduit for technology from the Eastern Bloc. And now stay tuned for chapter two, deeper into Vienna, more on the KGB and the Stasi. Marcus Wolf and how Werner Stiller ruined it for Udo and everybody in the gang. King of All Spies, Chapter 2, Von Stiller makes it hard for the Viennese Stasi residence gang, the Vienna Ring, the coolest spies in the world. So, the East, the Stasi is doing well. They have behind the scenes Marcus Wolf, and there's a book called Seduced by Secrets that covers some of Wolf and another book called The Man Without a Face. So the Stasi was doing well. It's a shut down society. You can see the endless files they have on everybody. There is a magnificent movie called The Lives of Others that shows you how rough it is. The, the man and the protagonist in the story is doing a screenplay and art and they're like is we will check out if this is agreeable to the stat to the state and again everybody has listening on their friends bugs everywhere so it's a lockdown society and not only that marcus wolf is decimating 
U.S. intelligence, British intelligence, West German police, West German intelligence services. Uh, he's sending in handsome men to seduce secretaries all throughout West Germany. He's getting everything. Interesting enough, uh, Vladimir Putin was stationed in Dresden and he may have had contact with Marcus Wolf more than we will ever know, my friends. In any case, Werner Stiller, finally. Werner Stiller, they, they call the book Seduced by Secrets because Werner Stiller was a ladies' man. He defects to the vest, Stiller. He gets everyone. And Udo Proch, early protege and friend, Rudolf Saka. Interestingly enough, he's a Jewish man, I believe. But he's a good friend of Proch who may very well have been some kind of Nazi. That's not why I like him. He's just funny. So, still our decimates everything. Finally, they get something on the East, the lockdown society. Rudolf Schacker says, they say I am an East German spy because I do business with East Germany. Does that mean that anyone who does business with East Germany is automatically a spy? Yeah, yeah. And Proch, the man of panache. I'm quoting from him uh, in an article uh, based on a book called Techno Bandits. Techno Bandits, Linda Milvern uh, is the lead author. Proch says, again, he, he, he responds to questioning from the press. Everything that has been written about me recently is a textbook case of how to frame someone as a spy. Unfortunately, I'm not a spy, but there are times when I might have enjoyed being one. There's a line where I'm trying to con you of the awesomeness of Troach. Also interesting enough, um, Julian Assange and his WikiLeaks, um, if you look through them on the, on the technical transfer of Austria, he does have telexes that he released about the procurement of technology from the West, Saka Technik und Wien, I do believe the Saka family, the Saka family, is the one from the Saka Tork, Tort, the treat that they probably serve at Daimel House. So, those of you within the means or or just want to sell out, and you're you get the message of my underground documentary here. You definitely want to go to Vienna and check out these spots. Go to the Club Daimel, Cafe Daimel. There's also a guy that's shadowy, Max Peterhans. Apparently, he was sort of Mr. Big behind these guys. And all of these postal box companies, so it's incredible. They have a labyrinth of postal box companies, Postfox. And they know what they're doing. And they're catching up. They, they uh, even on, on, on the earlier days of Von Bruckhausen and all these guys... They start to realize that reverse engineering is the way to go, right? You, you purchase the stuff, you reverse engineer it. Texas Instruments, um, all the all the stuff on Route One Twenty Eight, Boston, Burlington, Massachusetts, and over there, Silicon Valley in New York. No, sorry, excuse me, California. I'm sure there was some New York tech companies too. But Werner still against everyone and the cops, the West German cops, are on the trail of Saka. They even get poor poor Udo Proch's brother, Roderick Proch. Firms in, believed involved with the Eastern Bloc, they start busting them because of Werner Stiller. And he's got case offices, but the man is a lover. He loves the woman and he just, he runs away from the U.S. intelligence case officer and starts picking up chicks. And this is no joke. 
a Czechoslovakian couple, which I'll talk about in my last American spy docu- underground documentary. They got everyone. They just had a house of love somewhere in Washington, D.C., these Czech agents. And they just had swingers clubs and they got the Thai tech stuff and information. And, and of course, the infamous Cambridge Five decimated the MI6 British intelligence just by having some handsome guys and some bisexual guys, and I assume probably ladies, of course, the uh, notoriously the female operatives. A, uh, a skilled female operative uh, nabbed... Um, well, under cover as a cat woman, got uh, Ali Hassan Salame, the Red Prince. Of course, that wasn't a case of seduction. Uh, there was another operative that got Mordecai Venunu, an attractive woman, and on and on and on. Probably the the best method of obtaining espionage information is to get a handsome lady for the la- guys for the ladies and a pretty lady for the men, of course. Uh, I digress, I digress. Um, And we find out one of the uh, main guys is Karl-Heinz Fneudel, and he had some training as an engineer, and we'll talk about him in the final chapter when we really go to town on on this the East German defector, Werner Stiller, alleged that Sacker had written secret 74-page memo on state-of-the-art semiconductor manufacturing stuff, and they seized that. It was like a main overall assessment of Western chip-making. But it was all from public sources, so well, I guess he was pretty intelligent. At least that's what Sacker said. Hey, that's all public sources. Sorry. <laughs> Karl Heinz Fneudel indicated how, look, uh, we obtained this equipment, but be honest, the Eastern Bloc was developing reliable technology. In my forthcoming uh, documentary, The Last American Spy, I'm going to go more into Douglas Reed's At the Abyss, where a man named Gus Weiss, Gus Weiss, was the Mycroft Holmes of the CIA. And he, uh, they saw that the uh, um, Western intelligence and the Commerce Department, FBI counterintelligence, CIA con- counterintelligence, West German police, and on and on and on. They they were with the uh, COCOM and the Customs Department guys trying to catch up to these bandit smugglers, high tech Han Solos, um, because of course embargoed things are. The most valuable. What what's more valuable than cocaine and things like that? Embargoed means expensive. So Gus Weiss got the idea to sell it back to the Eastern Bloc, the KGB, particularly KGB Directorate T and Line X was the elite procurement group, as well as the guys I'm talking about over here, the elite of elite, the cool guys. The bomb crew out of Vienna, the Viennese scene, guys. Brilliant culture, ancient culture, the Austrians with their art. And I'm afraid a young artist named Adolf Hitler went in the wrong direction and was misunderstood by himself. To say the least, was out of German Austria. Uh, so they were putting, uh, messages in boxes like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. We got you, uh, customs and so forth. But Gus Weiss got the idea. Why not sell it to them? And they would use, uh, chipping techniques, modification. And 
if you look at Tim Weiner's Legacy of Ashes from 2007, the history of the CIA is a long history of disasters. In fact, the lead of the Directorate Operations, the Dirty Trick Department, took his own life because he tried for a Hungarian uprising in the Soviet military, put it down harshly, and he took his own life. And they were parachuting into Asia and just being captured. The lockdown society of Russia was closed. Until I might add Richard Kuklinski of the Poles defected. President Carter at that time had nothing in the airtight, hermetically sealed society of the Soviet Union. And even more so, the DDR, the East German Lockdown Society, East and West, crossing the wall. Thomas Reed talks about, he's an Air Force colonel, talks about how, for one thing, Leventer Barrier probably murdered Stalin. That was a revolution that came out of his book. But also this reverse ploy to sabotage the Soviets, which I'm going to go into deeper discussion in my last American spy. And at that point, I will even talk a bit about my own role as way back, believe it or not, being kind of a worker from a so-called, for a so-called proprietary company, I allegedly and wildly. So that culminates in the destruction of a pipeline in Siberia the largest non-nuclear explosion up there. So they sabotaged with the stolen technology. No comment on if that stolen technology was inserted in Chernobyl, by the way, something I've always wondered. But that's, again, a topic for another time. How does Udo Proch fit in this? Well, he's the most colorful member of the gang. But he gets named by Stila. And the Royal Confectionery and the Austrian press hilariously ask Udo, the approach, are you a spy? He bakes the cake and the star and sickle of the Supreme Soviet as an insult back to the press. He is wild. Jeez, this is interesting. I hope I can top it with the final chapter, guys. In any case, my sloppy documentary is impeccable in terms of not for quality, but for choice of subject matter. You at least got to give me that. And the cafes. And hilariously, Stiller, the lover, naming everybody. And Udo Proch, also the womanizer, seducing Daphne Wagner, marrying her. Basically talking her into, into doing pornographic pictures and bizarre things. Uh, and then when it comes to life in some of the WikiLeaks leaked documents. Again, Saka, Technique und Wien. Saka is Udo's protege that he just simply said, Werner Stiller is full of it. I compiled these professional ass assessments of Western chip-making ability, and it's all publicly available. Just like when they questioned Werner Bruckhausen. Oh, well, I ship this to there. And I, it's not against the law to ship this to there. Went to Berlin and to Paris and back and forth. And they were like, yeah, but it is illegal to ship it to Moscow, isn't it, pal? And he was like, well, yeah. And he did jail time with uh, a Miss Tuttle. And a Mr. Goldpool, who was an early examiner of the idea of using reverse technology. You, you purchase a steal the product and you do a reverse technology process and voila, you obtain it. Uh, don't forget, Richard Mueller was still working for the Stasi. 
And hilariously, um, somebody who I worked under shouted in jest, I'm not Mueller. I have a scar on my belly button to prove it. This is because this person, allegedly now that I knew, had a sort of similar technique to recut Mueller. That is, he would have a labyrinth of postal box companies, Labyrinthian and registered in Liechtenstein. The Liechtenstein Trust is legendary in the world of underground money laundering and money hiding. And Liechtenstein is, I believe, still the smallest country on earth. They still have a prince in a beautiful castle in Vaduz. So if you know anything about money laundering or anything like that, after the so-called Iran-Contra affair, it was said that secrecy wasn't as shall we say, effective in Switzerland. So some of the guys kind of retreated to Liechtenstein, a smaller area, very private, a principality where they make teeth and excellent stamps. Don't go there thinking they'll be friendly. They think you might be an IRS agent and spill some coffee on you. Because that's what they do. You go down the street, they have signs that they have private baking and the Liechtenstein trust again is an effective tool of hiding money. For one thing, I'll say this. I wish I knew it at the time, but um, the business owner uh, tied to the trust does not have to put their real name on the company registered by Liechtenstein law. So that's where it gets funny. You can use a pseudonym. You use pseudonyms all over the place. And Ricard Mula did that. And there's these wild stories of him barely escaping, being apprehended by customs agents, West German police and others. CIA counterintelligence after him for years. So he has a Liechtenstein Trust company, as did the late Robert Maxwell The probably the main owner of the postal box company in Liechtenstein is a Dr. Dr. Bartliner. When he died, uh, the interviews of him were pretty funny. Like you permitted a uh, deadly African dictator to use your Liechtenstein entities. And Dr. Dr. Botliner, an attorney of great distinction, probably a high up Freemason, re knight of Malta or whatever. <laughs> or oh, he's in the club of 1001, which is sort of like an Illuminati Club 45 himself. Club 1000 or Club 1001. He says, it's not my job to hold the hands of all my clients. He died a hero. Um... And that also can you remind me of the, uh, excuse me, that reminds me of the fact that Udo's Club 45, Freemason entity indeed, but the they are apparently not copyrighted, if you will. So there's a, they're not always necessarily interconnected. There's many types of Freemasonry lodges. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm not in on it. But uh, for instance, Club 45 is thought to be a socialist entity that Udo was operating under and the exact opposite over in Italy, Italia, the club Propaganda Du or the Freemason Lodge Propaganda Du or Propaganda Du was supposed to be fascist. Very different type of organization. Again, as I may have mentioned before, I did make a video a long ago piecing together a strange idea that the popular pop singer Falco, who gave us Rock Me Amadeus, and another song lesser known by Falco called Vienna Blood, or Vienna Blut, attacks, makes fun of, critiques Club 45 directly, of which Udo Proch was a member, and... He mocks Udo when he posed for 
probably a famous picture in Austria in a Napoleon outfit. And he's clearly doing the clinched fist under the coat uh, hand gesture of the Freemasons. So I speculated, did Falco get killed by Udo Proch and Club 45 for so blatantly calling them out? I believe Falco's friend was a journalist and a friend, and he was beaten to death or beaten badly by people associated with the shadow club, shadowy club 45. So this is the VNA scene. And the technicians, and of course, more or less the greatest hemorrhage of technology from Silicon Valley and Boston or Massachusetts's 128, Route 128, now home to Boston Dynamics and iRobot and things like that. And of course, Silicon Valley, the Kings, the Google, or interesting enough, Facebook is over at McLean, Virginia. So Ud Approach was buying up all this stuff. And that's the nature of uh, uh, espionage. And they said that uh, people like Theodore Wu, he was a customs operative. They were just trying to go crazy, just trying to catch these guys all over the place. Ricard Mueller, to the best of my knowledge, there's still no pictures of Richard Megabucks Mueller. And I've reached out to Jay Tuck of High Tech ban Bandits. Uh, no, excuse me. Jay Tuck is High Tech Espionage. And I have not managed to find out what became of Richard Mega Megabucks Mueller or Monoton Mueller. Perhaps he lives nowadays in Verduch Liechtenstein with a view of the castle. Stay tuned for our final chapter where we try to delve deeper more into the biographical sketch of Udo on the Viennese scene and anything I can get on the shadowy figure. <laughs>